Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. So with that, I'm going to make a mess of things. Um, thank you, uh, Gabe, for the uh, insightful and wonderful um, invitation uh, and introduction. Um, it's been great to be here the you know, 15 hours I've been in College Station. Um, and I'm going to do something, I'm going to try to do something tonight which is probably quasi-suicidal. I'm going to show you, and I'll never get an invitation back, um, I'm going to show you a bunch of student work to start, just to sort of flesh out uh, an ambient structure for my talk. And I'm showing you the work, A, because I think some of it's uh, quite interesting, and also teaching is quite a big part of what I do. I, I do almost no work because I have very little time to do that. But then I'll secondarily show you some of my own work and try to talk about uh, the capacities of architectural drawing and, and work that I do of, of various kinds. So if you stick with me, I think the first part's sort of a half an hour, and I'll go through things very, very quickly. There are a lot of images, and I don't expect you to uh, assimilate them, but to try to just breathe a kind of an atmosphere of disposition and attitude, structures of approach for the student work, and then I'll get a little bit more involved with my own work. Um, is this the one that I advance it with? Let's see. No. There. So 20 years ago, I developed a, a, drawing, a drawing type that I call strategic plots. And st strategic plots really have to do with plotting uh, phenomena, conceptual structures, and things, let's say, over and through time. So I worked through a pair of studios, one at Penn and one at SciArc, where we were trying to really work out how to visualize. This is, pr this is prior to digital. The paperless studios at Columbia were just underway sort of 1995 with uh, Bernard Schumi and, and company. But we were trying to work out how to work on a set of heterogeneous ideas, essentially, um, in which we didn't always have typologies or programmatic logics to uh, figure out what to work on. So um, I'm just showing you a batch of, you know, this is me sort of catching a pen on the way to an airport. Uh, details of drawings that belong to that body of work. I'm not going to talk about so much their content, but as a style of thinking, a way of working in which heterogeneous ideas were kept in play, uh, ideas were discovered rather than proved through the work, um, all kinds of formal material attitudes were opened up and so on through this particular kind of work. Um, uh, probably the richest work that I've been involved in, let's say, at the ideational level in 27 years of teaching. Uh, I'm going to touch on now, um, in my, when I get to my work, I'm going to identify 14 design methods. And I'll, I will, I'll pull those out a little bit and develop them. Right now, I'm going to show you a series of images that come from four particular design uh, uh, methodologies that I exposed to students uh, two years ago in a seminar at Michigan. So in this case, we're working we talked about this this morning in Sarah's studio. We're working syntactically. That is to develop a set of rules. In this case, the rules needed to, to they, the program was six and a third alphabetic forms, uh, pink and yellow, and the X, Y, and Z axes. So the students were asked to work syntactically by developing a set of rules that allowed them to work through operations in the computer to produce certain, let's say, formal effects. The idea with exposing the students to the methods is that the methods have huge range in terms of what they do well and what they don't do well. They have different authorial capacities for, for, for making work. Uh, they have different historical resonances and so on. So the idea in the, studio, in the, in the seminar was simply to uh, expose students to uh, uh, disciplines by which we produce work, in this case through design methodologies. In this case, a gestural translation, which is a gestural structure, and then a translation of that condition. So the body, imagine uh, putting on a Michael Jackson uh, song. Uh, eight people gesticulate wildly to that song. Video cameras are capturing the gestural structure and then translating that geometrically and mathematically into a physical formation as a possible architecture. 
So gestural translation has this, has this aspect. We use our bodies and then we translate. So the students were asked to produce a gestural translation using um, either a boule, le cue, or le doux uh, section. And I had a particular interest in those, those French architects and the work that they were working on at the time. Um, but again, this is simply an involvement in gestural translation to figure out what it does well, what are the opportunities, how does the author interface with it, what are its histories, and so on. So it's, it's very, very quick work. Uh, at most, probably 25 hours in one of these pieces of work, um, because that's what the seminar over two weeks, uh, they sort of produce that amount of work. Uh, and again, by moving through you know, ways of working, it exposed to them different formal and material vocabularies and ways that they would intersect with uh, ways of producing work in ways that they hadn't previously reflected upon. So this is uh, appropriation where the students are essentially using things that are found. And they're producing then qualities or, or characteristics, in this case in, a, in an image of a painted uh, ceiling, of churches in Rome. Uh, in this case, uh, an aircraft carriers. So they're inventing formal and material vocabularies for themselves as a way to, to extend their own uh, limitations, but also as a way to practice appropriation, as a way to work. No program. We're not worried. We, we isolate a lot of things. We're not worried about how to build them, that we could uh, get them through building compliance things, health and safety issues, and so on. This is another body of work in which I was asked the students to make um, a desert house by working through appropriation. So just a series of images. Uh, they could, they could invent the scope of the work. It had to be a, a diptychal desert house, had to be in a desert, but they, they, could, they could essentially identify uh, and make, make the work as rich narratively or ideationally as they wanted to. So this is a house that produces artificial weathers, uh, moves through the desert and constructs these artificial environments. Uh, this is a house that sort of buries and unburies, reconstructs itself and so on. This is a kind of surrealist house um, and one that uh, essentially animates uh, oral conditions, uh, sound conditions, a sort of plan for this particular house. Again, just by appropriating things and recombining those um, into new forms. And then, then a kind of parametric uh, way of making things. So I asked the students to develop a collection of objects which belonged to a surface, and that was the program essentially. And um, again, just just uh, variations on how how that uh, that means of working, uh, collection of objects and a surface uh, might develop. I'll move through these uh, quite quickly because again, I'm not I'm not so worried about uh, the specific content and the framing of things, just to give you a sense of the kind of range of things that that might be discussed in this case in a, in a seminar. Now I'm going to show you some studio work. Um, each studio that I, that I offer is framed uh, structurally and topically in a different way. Uh, so this one, they all have specific names. This one was dealing with surrealist tactics and ways of authoring and ways of configuring programmatic thinking. Uh, it was quite a long time ago at SIARC. Uh, so just to name some of the things we're looking at, this is a, uh, a theater for dead revolutionary poets that drags itself across the desert. Uh, this is a refuge for the refusal of dreams. This is a plan, and there are sort of 24 rooms that uh, uh, occupy this uh, realm. Uh, Sorry, this one's the refuge for the, uh, sorry, this, this is a refuge for the refusal of dreams. The previous one was the um, motel for 24 paranoias. This is a, an early construct, early constructs for a frozen motel zoo, uh, an optical anesthesia field station, early uh, constructs, uh, plan on the 
left for the optical anesthesia realm and an early visualization on the right, same student. Circus of migratory wind, uh, part of the same piece of work, so a series of objects that oscillate across a dry lake bed. Uh, here I was trying to open the student's conceptual um, apparati, so I gave them, they drew out of a hat, essentially uh, something that they would work on. This is an architecture that makes, erases, and remakes parts of itself. It's an, oops, it's an agri-zoo, the three towers in Pasadena. This is an architecture of fast and slow surfaces and fast and slow programs, so this is a plan. And this is the elevation of a series of agricultural surfaces and eating conditions. Time-lapse architecture, this is essentially a site drawing, the sort of proposal on the top and some analogous studies below. Uh, surreal materiality, uh, sort of record recording studio below and a hotel above, early proto-spatial drawing, some of the architectural elements made in Maya. Uh, museum for cross-dressing, milled Baroque, milled Baroque was the kind of conceptual grip, sort of thesis as it were, sort of views of spaces. Uh, an architecture that is, the architecture is delusional, paranoiac, and schizophrenic. Uh, this is a motel room within that architecture that's those three things. What would happen if you materialize the space of the building's construction rather than the building? So this is a materialization of the steel fabrication in MoMA, New York. Three houses in one and so on, uh, what would happen if you built the plan over there and the section over there. Refined form, I asked the students to deal with form from ethical, um, disciplinary and formal aesthetic points of view. They all worked on a house. So this is a rhino model house from Magritte in the clouds. It's a site, it's one of the interior spaces. This is a hybrid landscape house um, construct series of studies um, to produce that work. And this is one of the final images of that house landscape hybrid. A student was interested in the zeros and ones of Maya to worked on a house project in Anchorage, Alaska. It's an interior view of the house, another view of the house. Domestic restraints also uh, sometimes I double back on studios in terms of their content. I've done that twice, the Surrealist Studio and then the conceptual opening problem. This was complicated though because it had the conceptual drive, which this is three houses in one, but it also they had strange sites. So I was interested in, in Matthew Barney's drawing restraints projects in which he tries to restrain the body to generate alternative creative discipline. So we tried to work on a house that was also constrained or restrained. So they each had a conceptual device, a thesis, and then they had a site that was slightly odd. Three houses and one on an iceberg. Uh, fast and slow surfaces, fast and slow programs at the great uh, Zen garden at Kyoto was the site. So the house is the yellow bit. There's a loom that sort of weaves the landscape, the sky and information sort of simultaneously. So um, what, 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 what would happen if architecture was a fast change artist? So it could be Clark Kent in the morning, Superman in the afternoon. So these are constructs that look at that set of problems at the paired shrines at Issei in Japan. Uh, nocturnal architecture, what would happen for an, an architecture that just acted at night and the site was for the garden at Versailles, France. So there are 13 objects that Tease, play with, remanage that garden at night. Um, this student got red, R-E-D, in the Berlin, the former location of the Berlin Wall, and Chris produced a, basically a hostel that constructs and reconstructs itself depending on demands, but it traces and retraces the profile essentially and plan of the Berlin Wall. A uh, student got Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights as the site and was asked to produce uh, three houses in one. So the sites for the house are the painting, the gallery, the Prado 
Gallery in Spain, and Google Earth. This is one of the images produced for that house. Uh, and this studio is interested in material organizations and granular resolution. Uh, we worked on three sites, uh, Las Vegas, Melbourne, Australia, and Cambridge, England. They happen to have the highest Google resolution images in the world at the time, and that was part of our resolution interest. In Las Vegas, they worked on a short-term motel, uh, five minutes, two hours, and these are images from as a plan image of one of the proposals. There's a parking garage in this one. This is about as straightforward as it gets. These are images from the rooms um, in that same proposal. Uh, Bobby, uh, short-term motel, Las Vegas. Uh, the research, research and development was the programmatic structure in Cambridge, England, so this is next to King's Chapel, and these are straight renderings of a research and development sort of think tank realm. In Melbourne, they worked on an atmospheric institute, sort of, early drawings for that, and then straight up architectural proposal for that atmospheric institute. It's one of the bathrooms. Uh, this student was interested also in Melbourne about how you would reconcile Google Earth points of view and perspective and developed essentially a truck stop. And these are renderings of that truck stop. This is one of the ceilings. This is a sort of frontal view. Um, bathroom, sort of detail of bathroom, also in the bathroom. Whoops, form was interested in trying to develop form in, in its fuller guises, so trying to really address form in, at all kinds of levels. Students worked in different locations in the world. Uh, here, Mexico City. Student was interested in sort of political environments and that Mexico City is sinking and was interested in producing a series of interactive uh, generative apparatus that would essentially pump water into the underground system and that would register those underground logics in a series of sort of scroll-like pieces that sit in different places in the city. You know, pet architecture for Los Angeles. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll keep moving because there are a lot of images and I'll, I'm probably talking too much about them. Uh, Ideas that interiors would be quite different than exteriors, that this would be deployable, and so on. Uh, Lake Michigan, set of infrastructural proposals that um, rethink fishing industry, uh, civicness, tourism, and so on. These are images of um, some of the infrastructural pieces that belong to that scenario. Las Vegas. Uh, solar energy, capitalism, uh, promiscuousness, seduction, series of things outside the city um, in the proposal to set up the discussion of form in its fuller guises. Uh, here I was interested in trying to develop urban species which uh, exceed typology and are capable of negotiating difference and producing effects and characteristics over and through time that are differentiated. So everyone was asked to thematically, Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights was helpful for us in terms of some sub-conversations in the studio. Everyone was then asked to intervene, essentially, rethink Bosch's painting in new terms. Uh, oops. And then I was interested in the chrono part, the morph morphological shifts. So students were asked to produce images of things which had the change of fluctu had the sense of fluctuation, change, speed, and so on, just as a way to set up other conversations that needed to take place in the studio itself. And I'll just show you some proposals uh, for Detroit. We we all worked in Detroit, or they did. I didn't do any work. A um, set of species were developed spe to do with spectacularness in this case and sort of event conditions in the city. This guy said, Detroit's fine. 
and developed a whole set of sort of local protocols from uh, sort of billboard reconstructions to spatial operations in the city and so on. He made some renderings for uh, dealing with his interests. The student was interested in importing um, narratives from other places to remake parts of Detroit. So in this case, in a brick wall, there are things to do with Los Angeles and speed and intersections and suburbs and so on uh, being integrated into a brick surface. And in this case, a clapboard wall, having these micro environments that are imported from elsewhere as a way to uh, build up uh, the structure of Drew's work in this case. Worked on a pair of sites real sites on the left, things he was doing on the right. And this is a primary object, which is a sort of a, it's a, it's a thing which is a fictional, fictitious house for a journalist. And it 3D prints certain memory capacities that are gathered, 3D prints on the site, uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, reusing aging infrastructural pieces in Detroit. So the series of towers that get raised that are sort of four kilometers high at the highest, sort of laissez-faire in terms of how they get occupied and leased and distributed, a series of objects that uh, do work on existing infrastructural pieces in the city, uh, species developed there, uh, quite large infrastructural piece introduced, uh, we do with water, and then an image of some, some towers that get raised and housing that gets 3D printed uh, in the space of the city. And then quickly some graduate thesis work. And again, I'm showing you very, very limited, uh, you know, the students do 40 times the amount of work that I'm showing you. And it's much more interesting than I'm characterizing it. So it's quite reductive and out of context, but give you a sense of a little bit of the range. So the student was interested in working on mnemonics, memory devices, uh, capacities to retain and reconstruct information over and through time. This, this is pre-digital, so this, these are things. These aren't, it's not a Photoshop thing. And anyway, he eventually worked on a series of things at the Los Angeles Zoo. Uh, some drawings that set up the discussion, uh, characters, narratives, uh, interventional <laughs> strategies and tactics and so on. Uh, the student was interested in augmenting the construction doc document, said basically others are excluded from the conversation, so I'm going to produce a body of work which tries to investigate how the construction document might open itself up. And I'll just show you three images from some of the earlier work in when she was working on Peter Eisenman's Cantoreggio proposal in Venice, and John was doing a, a series of operations and, uh, on that proposal to try to open up uh, how the, uh, the working drawing, the construction document, might uh, discuss things outside of its known protocols. Uh, this guy was interested, uh, Mark was interested in mapping discrepancies. So how can we map the same place over and through time, and yet there are quite significant discrepancies? And the drawings are quite exceptional. Um, eventually made a kind of research institute in the Sea of Japan as a way to discuss uh, this problem of discrepancies and errors and mapping conditions, just a details of a construct that belonged to that proposal. Uh, Nayaro was interested in what we talk about as split geographies. And so in this case, uh, there are a set of deployable uh, mechanisms in Lake Michigan that boot information back to a series of characters in an alley essentially in Chicago, and those characters then enact and reconstruct information which is booted from Lake Michigan as a way to reanimate an abandoned and, let's say, derelict space. Interested in scanning, scanning malfunctions. So when you scan something that things you know, glitches and tweaks, how could that generate possible spatial territories? This is a speculative office building, two views in that office building. Uh, how can an architecture die in, in, in noble ways? So a series of characters and tactics about a building in Singapore that, that could die in a noble way. 
uh, heteronyms and their spatial possibilities, Portugal, P Fernando Pessoa, a series of interventions, uh, the coastline, uh, resurrecting Detroit through, let's say, ecclesiastical and spiritual metaphors. So a series of interventions, both local at the level of buildings, but also there's an infrastructure in the sky, which this, uh, the cloud of eyes, this is a view of it. This is looking through that new infrastructure, which essentially hovers over the city. Uh, architecture is uh, the city becoming third nature, and the ar uh, rather than expanding to the suburbs, how, how could we turn the city back on itself? Um, the work series of visualizations like these, and then this is the interior of one of the key buildings that discusses that set of problems. Um, an interest in phase shifts, uh, the catching the phase shifts between material states eventually playing itself out in an institute at the San Diego-Mexico border. Uh, Brian was interested in how he could take three authors that he uh, respected a great deal, Matthew Barney, Liz Diller, and the German painter Gerhard Richter, how he could fuse different values that they had, operating characteristics, uh, tendencies and so on to overcome his own authoring capabilities. Uh, so he made a series of probative drawings and eventually made a double house. This is the plan of the lower level. It's embedded in the ground. And this, this is the roof plan, essentially, to, ex to work on this problem of authorship and third person roles of the author and so on. Uh, student customs, his history, his family origins, ethnicities being lost. I was interested in how he might discuss those losses and eventually produced a gold leaf log. That's a microbrewery, a, a miniature touring machine uh, to do a Fallon touring, uh, three fishing rods. Uh, it's linked to the Odyssey and Ulysses and so on. Uh, quite thesis prize winner, quite nice work. Um, interested in student interested in virtual realms, things which are unintelligible, can't be seen, and producing a kind of museum for for such a realm. Uh, Paul Virilio implicated, uh, just visualizations of what that museum would be like. Uh, technophilia, technophilia, biophilia, so biological and technical, technological fuses and blends. A proposal for. Chicago, a set of housing proposals and landscape and infrastructural pieces. You can see the clouds are also uh, involved in, in the kind of ta entanglement of biology and technology and so on. Quite nice. Uh, Andy was interested in nonsense as a way to make sense of the world, so produced a whole series of uh, tactics and strategies and representational tropes that use nonsense uh, projectively um, as a way to generate uh, possible worlds. Um, uh, sort of narratives, uh, cross cultural references, series of 24 objects which migrate around the world and do work educationally uh, at the level of museums, at the level of, let's say, healthcare. Uh, a couple of images from from that realm. Uh, it's quite interesting piece of work. Uh, student was interested in camps, architectural camps, and how why why do they need to be siloed? What happens if we begin to crossbreed and pollinate those things? So these are the characters, and then he produced. Uh, was also interested in hybridization and crossbreeds early on. Produced a series of objects and then produced a series of plates or images which began to look at those crossbreeds and when camps leak into other camps and so on. Uh, quite nice uh, rhetorical but also uh, discursive and let's say even spatial representational work. Um, chrono hybrids, species, speciation, things that can reboot Detroit 
So a series of species which were developed um, that are active, that generate things, that use uh, recycle bits as one of the houses that gets involved in that discussion. A uh, student interested in nocturnal architecture used a, uh, essentially a sectional drawing of the uh, great um, uh, lighthouse at Alexandria as the site. So these using po uh, point clouds, uh, rendering techniques, uh, programmatic logics, inventive things to produce a spatial environment for a lunatic uh, in a nocturnal realm. I'm almost finished with the student work here. Just images from the installation. Trash, <clears throat> uh, how could we get on top of that? So sort of series of species uh, that were developed to uh, promote uh, sort of ethical positions relative to trash, and sort of geo-infrastructural scale things and local things. This guy was interested in magic, uh, South American poets, uh, worked on six domes in Rome, produced a series of interventions in these six domes, of which these are a couple of uh, sort of renderings of those interventions. Lifestyle, questions of authorship, who's the architect, um, how do we um, cultivate uh, sort of social involvement with the construction of architecture. Uh, quite a nice motel in the desert. Uh, problems of water and water as a material, uh, series of things that were done in uh, Venice, Italy. This is the interior of one of the realms and an object which sort of moves around the city. And this guy was interested in demolition, how that becomes a social, institutional, civic condition. Worked on the Michigan Theater, a whole series of apparati and rituals and processes. This parking garage actually moves around the city, goes to the suburbs, does some work, comes back. So on the red thing. Um, this guy was interested in um, exclusion uh, and worked on a guest house at Hadrian's Villa as a way to discuss uh, social norms, exclusions, stereotyping, and so on. And I think the, uh, just a couple more series of images. The student was interested in how we would um, empty content out of work and, and displace content into another place. So um, uses all kind of found material from uh, art sources, Duchamp, Koolhaas, and so on, and produced uh, essentially an environment uh, which discusses the problem of content and sort of the mechanics of things being instrumental and be displacing content to how things get transcribed and related to one another and so on. Quite nice. Everything sort of half scale, sort of odd sort of domestic environment. And a student here who was interested in the kind of conflation of the body and, and natural systems uh, produced essentially a house for project and a, a garden, orchard. These are images from, from that realm. So that's the end of the student work. So now I'll talk about, let's say, considerably less interesting work. Uh, which is which is mine. Um, first, I need to, I probably need to disclose a handful of things. One, um, I'm interested in trying to figure out what the scope of architecture might be, what what we're responsible for in 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 terms of making work. I'm interested in in being dexterous and versatile rather than specialized and uh, let's say totalizing. Um, and I'm interested in how. Uh, let's say the techniques and means by which we work might allow us to discover what what potential might be as much as describing or instrumentalizing what we already know. Uh, these are key things. I'm not going to elaborate these things, but these are things that matter to me, let's say, continuously. 
relational thinking and relational assemblies. And that's quite complex for me. Uh, key things that I've sort of focused on would be broadening the ways in which we conceive architecture, let's say the architectural drawing, desi design methods, and then sort of as a second set of things, the naming problem, that is when we named things, we've already excluded a lot, the roles that things play, so I'm interested in what I call the mechanics of engagement, the roles that all the variables play in a piece of work, uh, when they're in, how long they're in, what their capacities are, language folds, I'll touch on those in terms of the way I use language to help me generate work, parallel thinking through analogies, uh, working on visualizations that are particular to what I'm actually working on, and then multiple ideas rather than homogeneous ideas in a project. So the conceptual breadth, these things I care about, and I make projects of different levels of finish. So I've got about 70 conceptual catalysts of which I gave the students some earlier when I showed earlier work. These are things that are, un they're, they're lightly finished projects, but they keep my conceptual uh, imagination alive. So what would um, digital mania, what would that be? Or architecture that winks, growls, and takes us two, two steps across the site while changing land values on the run. Uh, duplicate a domestic interior, sending the clone into the neighborhood to commingle with other Houses. So I've developed for myself seven categories that I think of as contemporary categories. Materiality, fabrication production, atmospheres, change and flux, multiple temporalities, duration. Um, so time-lapse architecture, what would that be? So each of these is a project within this uh, structure of seven, for me, categories that are helpful, growing a building. Uh, spatial ventriloquism. So I'm just wondering how to keep my imagination alive, but how to open up um, the ways we might conceive spatial thinking. When is the time of rendering? Not I put the clock on two o'clock in the afternoon and render my drawing that way. Uh, the second thing that's been really, really important to me is the way, the means by which we produce work, that is design methods. Um, I've had hundreds of people literally say, you should do a publication or a book or something on this. I don't know enough about it to do that, A. But B, um, it's, it's just a part of what I do, and I can't make it a full-fledged effort. But if you think about the ways in which these different methodologies allow you to produce work, formally, materially, conceptually, the ways authors relate to them, and so on, that you can produce radically, radically, radically different work by each of these methods. They're not the only methods, there are many, many more. We use methods in combination, we innovate methods and so on. This is a critical part of what I do and what I teach. And when we, when we talk about methods, we talk about where they come from, what, they're, what they are, where they come from etymologically, what they do well and don't do well, how authors interface with them, how they interface with other methods, um, what are the precedents by which these methods are deployed, let's say case studies, and then we try to develop a template for operations. How do you work within a particular method? This to me is vast, totally underdeveloped in terms of teaching. I don't know anyone in the world, to be honest, who actually works on it. That doesn't mean that I think it's right. I think it's really important. We don't actually understand the means by which we produce work. So when I went through the student examples and identified you know, quickly four different ways to produce work, that's part of that discussion. And then the, the business of visualizations, which if, if anyone knows of me, they tend to think of me as someone who draws and uses the drawing to do, some, to do something. <coughs> um, sometimes the work table looks a little, little like this. Um, I've developed drawing types for myself uh, which are helpful um, uh, from aspectival drawings in which you're drawing the critical aspects of something to proto-strategic plots in which I was trying to figure out the problem of plotting things over and through time to strategic plots um, to thematic drawings in which I'm just trying to visualize the key interests of a project before there's any formal or material attitude. 
Uh, these, all these drawings are developed for very specific phases in the work, things I'm trying to work on. Uh, cryptic drawings have to do with, let's say, the genetic or chromosomal structure of work. Protoformal drawings are prior to form but have indications of geometry, material properties, uh, organizational logics. Relational drawings, we're just working on relationships, on this, in this case erasure, just working on problems of erasure and uh, censoring, bleaching out. Uh, composite drawings, they're fairly familiar. We're using multiple languages, elevation, section, notation in the same drawing. Analogous drawings in which things behave like other things, things look like other things, things are organized like other things, but they're not those things yet. So, so I've got a, for me, a set of working, you know, sort of representational techniques that are, have been helpful. I'll show you a series of failed projects. Um, house commissions, uh, I just started teaching at SciArc. And uh, commissions, competition, work that um, allowed me to really understand my own limitations. Um, uh, it's a desert house. Um, uh, they, were, they all seemed the same to me. I worked on them similarly. I thought about them similarly. And I realized that, um, uh, you know, in 1990 that I didn't have, I didn't have much to say and I, I'd never exist for 50 or 60 years. Uh, the work just wasn't interesting enough to me. Um, again, it was all the same. No way to get 50, 50 years juice out of this. Um, Again, just, just working a real commission, sort of 1,600 square foot house in the desert and so on. Interest to do with context and enigmatic conditions of the desert and client needs and, and so on. Made a second version of that house where I started to open up the drawing a little bit, the aspectival drawing. So this is another version of that, that previous sort of graphite drawing house. And then Amy was doing a PhD in Cambridge, England, so I developed a room, essentially. Uh, there's a leather floor, a double aquarium, a kind of steel wall with cactus. There are some encrypted languages in the thing, and so on. Um, so all this work caused me um, great consternation. Uh, it didn't seem very good. It, wasn't, it didn't seem interesting, and blah, 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 blah. So I got probably the pivotal piece of work for me uh, was the David's Island competition. Um, run just I did it just before uh, the early strategic plots that I showed you, the student work. So I was developing the strategic plotting business. And here the architectural drawing began to open itself up in terms of what I could discuss, uh, that I could generate interest through the drawing as much as prove them. In this case, I was developing programmatic thinking to deal with the key issues of the proposal, which the ideas and issues had to do with islandness and remoteness and panoramic and panoptic vision, maritime thinking, nautical cartography. So there are a lot of issues at stake. And I was using the drawing as a way to generate, again, programmatic thinking. So there are landings for mythical sea travelers. There is silver shell surface. There are flooded landscapes, there are multiplied officers, headquarters, and so on. All of those things deal with the key issues or ideas of the project, but the drawing was really a harbinger or a kind of cauldron for me to think visually to discover the potential of the work. And this is a simple technical drawing of easement fencing and labyrinths of emptiness and the landings for mythical sea travelers and so forth and so on. Surveillance garden, polished metamorphic rock garden, and so on. So the drawing began because I was trained through conventions, uh, plans, sections, elevations, oblique axonometrics, perspectives. I couldn't figure out how to make that kind of models. I couldn't figure out how to hold the ideas that I was thinking about in those kinds of drawings. So I began to try to open the drawing up a little bit. 
there are thematic drawings. So for a museum, I was trying to, again, just think through the key issues um, of the work, uh, problems of curation, things to do with historic, aesthetic, and scientific understandings of collections, the urban roles of the museum, the historical etymology of the Greek muses, and so on. Just try to visualize key aspirations for the work. Then the cryptic drawings started to develop. These are details of uh, sort of the genetic or chromosomal structure of the proposal. Uh, again, cultivating the drawings, really working through uh, intent, uh, misreads, aberrations, uh, suppositions, hunches, letting those things sort of breed, cultivate themselves in the drawing. Uh, there's a drawing for an alabaster surface that has nine Greek muse-inspired instruments that draw and etch away at the alabaster surface and so on. Anyway, it's not, it's not so important the specific content, but the drawing um, allows, again, forms of visual thinking, hunches, certainties, multiple languages to be used simultaneously to keep things in play long enough to see whether they're relevant. So this is a sectional drawing. And then we made an early, visual, early visualizations, uh, first rhino model of the museum uh, proposal. Um, I would call these uh, sort of first sketches, sort of chipboard models. I wouldn't call them design at all. Um, but there are things like there are cattle and uh, fescue and roses and gardens that you can't get into and robotic things that manicure <coughs> parts of the proposal and three sets of Greek muses which operate urbanistically at the level of the site and internal to the project and so on. I you know, wouldn't call it design at all. Sort of inscriptions, tractor square dancing, beauty pageants for farm animals being constructed to try to augment the historical and typological dimensions of the museum and so on. More recently, a handful of years ago, trying to now work on the prime, you know, sort of primary building that we looked at the section through. Working on erasure. As a, as a possible way to generate work, both representationally but also spatially. And I had an idea about a house that I would essentially erase and recode practices, equipment, furnishings, habits. So this is just a relation, these are just relational drawings that try to work on the problem of erasure, recoding, rebooting through a pair of objects that now try to re-inhabit this bleached out, erased, censored condition. Just represent, it's not a section or a plan, or just a relational drawing. Uh, as a result of some of the work getting quite heavy for me, I said, what would happen if I develop my fast twitch muscles and try to design quickly with a limited set of ideas? So I worked on a house where I just try to figure out relationships to ground, sky, and horizon. And I made three proposals. This is a site drawing for one of them. This is a site drawing for another one of them. And then I'm going to show you the one that's developed a bit. So all the projects have, you know, there's like sketchbook stuff. There are probably 60 of these for this project, uh, 125 of them for the museum, and so on. So there are parallel lives being led um, in the development of a proposal. Yeah, normal, just normal stuff. Um, the first drawing for this house and the idea initially for the house was the ground, sky, and horizon, trying to get involved in that. And then eventually there are a series of landscape milling machines. This is done in 2003. So milling machines are known now. And, but there are a series of, in this, in this proposal, there are a series of machines that mill the landscape. And in this case, they mill a series of garden surfaces uh, for the objects of the house. Um, and a series of drawings which were made to try to etch out this particular house. And they, again, a sketch, let's say a sketch uh, for, for the house. So there are garden surfaces, uh, a whole series of them that are milled. There's a space that you live in. 
but it's filled with logs and you don't actually live in it, you live in two baskets. You sleep in this piece that moves along a pink dust garden. There are two things inside of this object. You eat in that lozenge-shaped bit. There's a storage piece below it. Things to do with branding and capitalism are involved. There are three chromed shadows. Each of the big objects has a chromed shadow. There's a chromed billiard ball. Um, there's a cast bronze biplane. And there's a labyrinth that you don't get into. And there are real and milled cacti. And there's an object just above the billiard ball that sits inside of the dining space. And there's a cactus wall. And you can see the um, chrome shadows. And then you see the sun shadows. So there's a, there's a discussion about multiple temporalities here, multiple technologies, time frames in which you're uncertain about what time you're actually in the desert, things to do with subtle shifts in perception of the desert. Erasure is an architectural activity, blah, 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 blah. Here you see the, the chrome shadows. There's a chrome shadow there, and there's a chrome shadow over there. You sleep in these bits. They move up and down. There's a little stair to nowhere. It's three inches wide at the end. These are all coming out of the work of ground, sky, and horizon, um, trying to generate the thinking um, as I work through. And for me, this is a super simple, uh, it's a very, very simple project. Uh, there you see the chrome shadows. And all, the, all of the garden surfaces have encrypted sort of languages that belong. Each, each garden surface has a different language um, in which you're meant to, they make sense of something, but you're not privy to what they make sense of. Uh, yeah, this is, the, this is the living space that's filled with logs. On its side, there's a miniature version of the proposal that's built. There's a mechanical hawk that belongs to that, and then there are real hawks in the desert. And you're seeing the edge of the labyrinth. And this piece dematerializes. It's calibrated to dematerialize over 100 years, so the steel essentially dematerializes. And this piece leaves a pile of logs on the site. Again, I won't go into the relational thinking so much, but um, that was quite fun. It's a, it's a sketch as well. It's not designed. I was invited to the Prague Biennale and asked to deal with architecture as a transient phenomenon. So I developed what I call the metaspheric zoo, which is a cross between metas metaphor and atmosphere. Developed six species in the zoo and three programmatic elements. And this is a kind of thematic, strategic drawing. The, the work didn't get developed. But these are biopsies from that strategic drawing, which try to deal with uh, architecture is a transient phenomena using animality, bestiality, um, instinct, and desire as ways to back into the transient problem um, more complicated or complex than I'm making it sound. But this, this, this work I'm interested in, uh, it needs to be developed and simply isn't. Uh, we get this is incredible at the school. There are five grants of $20,000 a year called Research Through Making Grants. And I applied the first year and got one. And I was interested in what I call spatial blooms. And that is how we would cross landscape organizational principles, landscape biologies, and landscape elements to try to produce an alternative temporal spatial realm. So we made a series of visualizations in which, in this case, we're trying to blossom uh, the ceiling at El Jesu in Rome, and then other studies, just a whole series of things, in this case, trying to get landscape organizations and landscape elements to begin to uh, discuss one another. Analogous drawings, same objectives working analogously through uh, landscape organizations and landscape elements. No landscape biologies or no temporal uh, stuff yet. Uh, lots of images like these. Fabric predators were part of the programmatic thinking that came out of it. 
Uh, there are notational and graphic landscape conditions, things called zipper blooms, uh, reflexive conditions. Whoops, these are early studies of zipper blooms, which you know, lots of things that they're about. Visualizations about what, what these realms might be a little bit like. Test tube berm, notational and real landscapes that begin to tangle with one another. Um, species, speciation, and so on. It probably got 12% of where we needed to get in a larger trajectory. Uh, I'm very, very grateful for the opportunities that I have and the people I'm around. Got invited to produce two pages in a book. Uh, there were 30 of us from around the world, 24, sorry, from around the world who were asked to produce two pages in a book. Two weeks apiece, hot potato it to the next person in Pittsburgh or into New Delhi or wherever they were. So I was thinking about alchemic urbanism. The framing was documenting urbanism, and I thought about alchemic urbanism, how you would harvest essentially surpluses in the city and the drawings, the two pages in the book try to you know, auger into that and use word plays and language folds and so on. Working on a piece of work now where I'm trying to think about envelopes, vertical surfaces, uh, and so on. Uh, so just things to try to, um, there are six of them, try to auger into that a little bit. Uh, it's a bit old work, but I'm working on a pair of new ones at the moment. Um, Uh, I don't know. I can hardly turn the computer on. As you could tell, Gabe had to come and just get to the next PowerPoint. So recently, I've been just trying to figure out how to cut and paste in Photoshop. So I made a series of just, you know, sort of 20-minute studies. I mean, they're literally just trying to figure out how to cut and paste. Um, and just trying to work through, you know, a couple of small ideas. This one has to do with a speeding landscape. Um, this is to do with sort of hyper, sort of hyper objects in a in a miniature, there's a miniature realm, uh, a quasi speeding landscape, and then what I was thinking about is a kind of post temporal landscape. I mean, literally 20 minutes, me just trying to figure out how to cut something and paste it in, and you know, fiddling. I was asked to make a cover for a new online journal called Edge Condition and develop this piece called Cloud Veil where I develop three cloud types that essentially try to veil my own work. And my friend Nat Shard and I were you know, very, very fortunate and super grateful to uh, win Pamphlet Architecture 34. And we were interested in um, problems of indeterminacy and contingency as a way to practice, but also to move away from architecture that prescribes how we behave. Uh, so a series of drawings that I made try to imagine, thematically imagine a realm where you would practice indeterminate architecture. These drawings have to do with that. Um, and then we, um, Nats develop a, a bunch of kinds of work of which drawing instruments are a part. So we essentially, we develop two drawing instruments. Nats is on the right, mine is on the left, in which we were trying to work on this problem, of, these problems of contingency, uh, representation, um, authorship, narrative constructions, and so on. So each of us has a kind of dome that has a kind of narrative realm. Uh, we have a surface. We have an object that interrupts the paint throw. And then we have a set of calibratory mechanisms, levels, and jigs, and so on. Um, and the, this work was made specific to um, the pamphlet work. We're working on um, a new piece of work right now, which 
one exhibition in London. It's related to a second book that we're working on. So anyway, these are just these are images of um, <clears throat> of a particular part of the work that we made to, to try to evolve the business of indeterminacy and, and uh, contingency, perspectivization, uh, metrical thinking, narratives, lots of things at stake. So you see the, the object that interrupts the paint flow. And in this case, you're seeing paint that's being thrown from the instrument that I'm in, uh, involved in and, and vice versa. Uh, this is another piece of work that we're quasi involved in, neither of us actively right now, but um, yeah, so I won't, I'm almost finished. If you can last another five minutes, I'm, I'm getting there. So last summer I was asked to, with 29 other architects, I was asked to design a birdhouse to be exhibited uh, and sold for auction for nonprofit benefits in Italy. So we made a series of, uh, the idea eventually is, uh, I've got an idea about developing 13 birdhouses that essentially try to reflect on what I do and why I do it. So this is round one. Uh, these are some early drawings which uh, try to put some ideas into play and then this is the thing. Uh, it's a, it's the Flights of Fancy Bird Motel. So there's a bird landing strip. There's what's called a deep taxidermic and taxonomic bird, the yellow bit. There's a garden. There's a watering hole, the yellow thing in the middle. And there's a bird rug. There are three clouds, the elliptical pieces, the big cloud, holds the name of the bird motel, the Flights of Fancy Bird Motel, and it has a windsock room. There are two optical devices that allow birds to scan and navigate um, territory. There are three hedges. One of them doubles as a perch storage. And there are five perches. And there's a kind of jacuzzi pool realm. So you know, it's quick. Uh, it's not quick to make it. It's milled and 3D printed and, and painted and then shipped. That's what it looks like. Uh, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, narratives involved, uh, things to do with human natural reversals, uh, things to do with control, surveillance. Uh, taxonomic interests and so on. This is the deep bird, the taxonomic. It's a sort of ritual, iconic, uh, let's say almost ecclesiastical element in the, in the work. You don't actually see it, uh, but it's an important, it's a super important part of the proposal. And then we just fiddled around a little bit, taking the, taking the uh, bird motel for a walk. So there's an idea that it occupies different environments, in this case, the eye of a flamingo. And now there's a second version of it being what they're working on it currently. And there are a lot of stand-ins. So the, um, so it's a bird landing surface and a garden. There's a stand-in for the water table. There's a stand-in for the uh, bird table. There's a stuffed technology garden. There are um, topiary hedges that are in the configuration of a bird alphabet that inscribe marks in the top surface that are, belong to a dome below that belongs to um, a bird ballroom. It occupies this hull piece. There are propellers. There's dioramic wallpaper. Um, so this is just that's early early days. This is a section through the bird ballroom and the windsock houses and uh, the bird alphabet hedges are above and sort of really early trying to figure out the sectional properties of of this thing. Just this sort of fun. Um, just an early. 
again, stand-ins for the, for the lower bird, but starting to get involved in the upper surface and the choreography of inscriptions of the dancing hedges and so on. And then you can see the Steph Technology Garden, which has all kinds of aerial objects, uh, satellites, dirigibles, and so on. So there's a kind of bird trophy room, but it's human uh, conditions which make that bird trophy room, and there are padded upholstered perches in that realm and, and so on. So it's, it's very, very early days. This is just, just stand-ins for the stuff technology garden. So there'll be rockets and then the um, upholstered perches and so on. Uh, current work with Nat, Chard. Um, these are a series of just very, very quick studies for aerial Diptic follies uh, that try to, to that try to um, that's complicated. They're didactic instruments that are masquerading as a series of characters in an aerial landscape uh, at Orford Ness in the west coast of England, and these are just early visualizations to try to to try to get into certain thematic concerns, um, certain interests of the work. Um, sort of from my perspective. And Nat's doing a series of things as well, and we, we, we just figure out how they, how they might discuss one another and so on. And these are, these are literally sort of 20 minute, 20 minute studies made three, four weeks ago, to, you know, shot with an iPhone camera. And I'll show you just one handful of images and then I'm finished. So I've made almost 800 landscape drawings. And I make them in series. They're all 18 by 24, 9 by 12 in the format. They're very, very light. They, occur, they're, they take uh, half an hour to two hours a piece. Uh, don't throw any away. I used to make one a day, and I did that for six weeks. I get up, shower, eat, make a drawing. So these are just images from a series. Um, so I'm interested in, you know, calligraphic landscapes, Chinese and Japanese influences, uh, fungal landscapes. I had some cadmium red, an acrylic on my work table and said, I wonder if I could, you know, what would that be to work on those? Monochromatic landscapes and so on, red ponds, invisible. So these are the last images. Um, and just, just three to finish. Just show you, yeah, it's monochromatic landscape, trying to think about what, what if, could landscapes have monochrome dispositions and then highly, highly saturated parts of them. And that, that's the last image. Uh, so I'll, it, I think it's still Monday. I'm not sure. Um, but I, I'm, I'm finished. Thank you all very much for coming. It's been